Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to the TSS. The theme of the month is so like today. Goodbye, winter blues. And this is what we all want. We want this winter blue to really leave us. So today, Joe is going to help us understanding a little bit more about uh, the value of life. How do we value life? And he's be talking about protecting the vulnerable, the people who go through euthanasia. So it's a very interesting topic. I hope you all enjoy it. So for we are going to have our first reading and I'll follow with the prayer. So I would like to ask Kim to do the first reading for us. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Mm -hmm. um, blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Jesus, Luke 6, 22. The problem of the blessings requires serious reflections before being interpreted as a resolved question in the framework of knowledge. Jesus confers the credential of blessed to the followers that share with him the afflictions and the tasks. Notwithstanding, it is important to point out that the master classifies sacrifices and suffering as educational and redeeming blessings. It is necessary then to know how to accept them. This or that individual will be blessed for having created goodness within material poverty by finding happiness in simplicity and in peace for knowing how to maintain a long and divine hope in his heart. However, what about the sincere adherence to the sacred obligations of the title? The master, in the supervision that characterizes his teachings, refers to the eternal blessings, but there are a rare few that get close to them, with that perfect understanding of one who approaches an immense treasure. The majority of the less fortunate on the terrestrial plane upon being visited by pain, prefer the lament and despair. If they are invited to give testimony on renunciation, they slip to improper demands. And almost always, instead of working peacefully, get involved in undignified adventures in which they get lost in an uncontrolled ambition. Jesus offered a great deal of blessings. However, only a rare few desire them. For this reason, there are so many poor and many afflicted people who could be in great need in the world, but who are as yet not blessed by heaven. Thank you. So let's bow our heads. Elevate our thoughts to God, our Creator, to Jesus, our Master of Love, our Guiding Light, to all the spirits present here today, the incarnate and discarnate ones. And it is with our hearts filled with gratitude that we give thanks to God to be here together with all of you and with his teachings to make our lives a little bit more closer to what he represents and ask him to guide Joe, the lecturer of today, so he can inspire us and give us the clarity of our minds to understand the teachings of this lifetime. So be it. Thank you very much, and Joe. See you, Joe. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Great to see you here today. For those who are watching us live or will be watching this later on, you might know, might not know what's happening for Sandra to say in a day like this. But today is the 12th of February, and we're having a bit of a snowstorm in Toronto. So instead of goodbye winter blues, maybe we're saying hello winter again. Um, when I first saw this topic, and uh, our brother Marco Giclet, he organizes this for us, 
And uh, the theme of Goodbye Winter Blues is very appropriate, because <clears throat> typically after December, January, February, it's kind of we're getting into our lowest point. A little bit depressed, it's cold, we're eager for a little bit of heat, nice sunny days. And this winter has been a bit of a mix of that. So it was a great theme. But then I saw the suggestions of the topics for lectures. So last week we had fear of death. Today we're talking about euthanasia. Say, why is this related to winter blues? This sounds at first sight a bit of uh, depressing themes, right? Deep things. And by the way, for those expecting to see Denise here talking about depression, I'm happy to say that uh, she'll be back next week. We had to switch around. So hopefully uh, you will be a very bit of a patient with me as we go through this very deep topic. But then, you know, going back to the question, why are we talking about Goodbye Winter Blues and, and why are we talking about such difficult topics as we started? And, um, you know, always impressed by the wisdom of our brother De Clay. It is in these times where we're kind of locked in, as often we are in the winter, where we're still waiting for something else to happen, in our case, waiting for spring to come, that is a good time for us to contemplate some more deeper, difficult topics in our lives. It might be coming in from the beginning of the year, doing the planning for what we're going to be doing, trying to resolve some um, challenges that we may have. So it is the right time for us to take the opportunity to ponder, to think, and maybe move forward our understanding or at least our appreciation of these things that we need to face in our lives. So, those who might have been here last July, we had uh, a great symposium, and we call this the value of life. <clears throat> And we had speakers talking about the very aspects of why life is so important to us and why God has gifted us with this thing called life. My lecture was about euthanasia, so I thought it would be a good time to bring it back. And I've made some changes to create some, provoke you into some different thoughts this time. So I hope you enjoy it. Let's start. Euthanasia, it's a topic that doesn't go away. It's been around forever, as long as we've been humans. But even more recently, the debate around assisted death, in terms of um, kind of dignity in death, end of life choices, we hear all of these terms. And this has been over the last year or so, and that was the reason I put this in my, my subject last year, because we just passed last year a law that allows, in many senses, a certain, under certain conditions, that doctors or healthcare professionals might terminate someone's life. And in Spiritism, we know that any action that we take against God's laws will be consequences. And among one of the most important of these laws is the divinity of our life. As I said, it's a gift that God has provided us. And by terminating it before His desires means that we're basically rejecting that gift. And as we'll see through the lecture, there might be some very kind of strong reasons why people might want to do that. Both as the person itself to which death will come, but also to those who make the decision or the choice or help them in achieve that goal. But nevertheless, as we know, none of this eliminates or avoids the consequences, the price we will pay for that decision. 
And above all, it is traced around a moral dilemma. And this is why all moral dilemmas are so complex in terms of mapping this to our legal system. Because not everyone has the same concepts of morality. They're impacted by our culture, by our education, by our religion, by our experience. So even within a group like ours, that's, you know, a group of spiritists, we will diverge at times in our understandings of morality. Imagine then in a whole country. So it is understandable that within a broader population such as the Canadian, composed of so many different religions, ethnic groups, um, people from all over this world, that it becomes necessary to try to find a minimum common ground around that morality without being biased as much as we can, because it's almost impossible not to be biased, um, on our own beliefs of what life is and what happens after life. So, euthanasia basically is terminating one's life. More often are people who are critically ill, possibly very near death, and they choose to be terminated, to discarnate before the body actually does that. So through drugs or other mechanism, these people then die. We also see a growing trend that other individuals that are not in death's bed, but have kind of a very tragic sentence of a serious illness are choosing then to also terminate their lives. So they do not have to suffer, so their family may not have to suffer through the long, often painful stages of the disease that will eventually or almost certainly kill them. So there are many arguments that people, especially those who have maybe a more materialistic view of life, that do not believe in afterlife, or have a different understanding of God's wishes for us, that they have arguments of why even Christians, people of good, should do this act. First is the more liberal thought that this is a private matter, and we have no right to interfere. So, suicide, euthanasia, so all decisions of the individual, and the state should not have any kind of right to limit what we want to do. Not an unreasonable kind of <coughs> argument. And spiritism, we believe that we all are uniquely and individually responsible for our acts. So if we decide to do something, we will pay the consequences of that act. So as long as we're doing to ourselves, why should anybody care? Well, we will see that no such action is completely isolated to one individual. It will impact the lives of at least two people. The one who is dying and the one who is helping them die. More commonly, we impact many other people, relatives, family members, children, spouses. And the hope that these people have is that this impact will be difficult at first, but in the long range, it would have been better for everyone that this would have happened. Another argument is that we have the right to decide how we will die. It's a right that we have. Similar to the first argument, again, we have the right, no, we have the ability to do whatever we want. 
from maybe man's law, maybe we do recognize that right. But from God's law, we do not have that right. But of course, we're back to moral versus legal. If I do not believe in God, then I will only focus on the legal right. But for those who do believe in God, who do believe in the divinity of the gift of life, we should at least understand that we do not have a right to do this. We may still do it. It's our option. But God has not given us that right. In fact, among even the Ten Commandments, the very first rules that come to us, comes thou shall not kill. It does not say thou shall not kill another person. It says thou shall not kill. So thou shall not kill yourself. Next argument is <clears throat> the notion of quality of life. We're back to the materialist view, especially of those who believe that there's only one life. That says, if this is the only life I have, I want it to be the best life I can have. And that means I will <clears throat> avoid, run away from suffering. Because I want happiness in my life. I only want the good things in life because that's what I deserve. Fairly selfish. The other ones are always back to these issues except the last one. <clears throat> so everything here is around the individual's right to do as they want and not be impacted or imposed by somebody else's beliefs. And as spiritists, you know what? We have to respect that. We are not allowed, we're not supposed to be imposing our beliefs in anyone. So if they choose not to believe in an afterlife, if they choose not to believe in God, or if they choose to believe that God allows them to do these acts, we should not be judges of them. But the last one is the one that worries me a lot. Especially in situations where there's a cost of end of life, people are using the other arguments to justify that you know, the money that's being spent on Joe as he's dying, it's not good money spent. He's going to die anyway. We may not, most people here may not know, but if you take the cost of health care for your entire life. So how much money you spent your entire life in your health care. It's not just not, not food or health, but in, in hospitals and doctors and so forth. The last six months of your life will represent over 50% of your lifetime costs. Because it's very expensive. Especially if you have a disease, you're in a hospital, it costs a lot of money. So there's a strong pressure, especially with families, especially with survivors, who says, well, daddy's going to die, so why is he going to take away all of my inheritance now? Why should I pay for him? Do this. Let's convince him that it's okay to, you know, not burden us financially with all of this. In countries where we have universal health, the decision then is for the health system. When is it good money spent to keep people alive? It's a terrible, terrible thing to be thinking. Because it takes us away completely from the spiritual and the um, emotional aspects of that decision. And brings us to the most materialistic point, which is money. And there is a very grave and imminent danger that people will be convinced to accept the idea of being killed through these arguments, when in fact their soul, their spirit, may be rejecting it. The reasons against it are many. 
from our doctors and, and in Canada, and this is not the case in other countries, but in Canada, our law only allows a healthcare professional to perform whatever is necessary to terminate a life. So you, if you're not a healthcare professional, you're not allowed to euthanize your spouse, for example, if they're suffering. So we've created some semblance of rules and controls, but at the end of the day, if a family wants it, the, the healthcare professionals, eventually they'll have to find somebody to do it. Now, the healthcare professional is not mandated to do it if they don't feel good, which is a good safeguard, but there will be many who will be willing to do it. So if a family really wants it, they will get euthanized here in Canada. But professionally, we should not force doctors who have an oath to protect and do away from pain and, 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 and keep people alive, force them into actually killing them. The more theological to us, spiritists, it is suicide. Especially if there's a consent of the individual who's being euthanized. Sometimes there are scenarios where they will not need the consent of the individual. If they are not able to make a decision, if they're unconscious, if they've been in coma, whatever, the family can make the decision for you. So if you don't want that, you have to put that in a legal document that says, I do not want to be euthanized. But if you make the decision, even if somebody else is doing it for you, it is suicide. You have desired, and you have allowed, and you have created the conditions for which somebody will kill you. And we know that among the spirits who visit here regularly on our mediumship sessions, the ones that have been suffering the most are those who have committed suicide. Because it's a flagrant violation of one of God's most important divine laws. So here's the battle, right? Material, mater material versus spiritual. We can't force anybody to ha have the same beliefs, but we can educate, we can promote the options for life. And Tiago talked about this last week, around death. What is death? And it seems like, you no. Know, Everybody dies, so it should be easy enough for us to define what death is. But the reality is that it's been proven very difficult. 100, 150 years ago it was very easy. The person stopped breathing, they're dead. And then they would be buried. A small fraction of those would wake up in the coffin because they weren't technically dead. They just had kind of a, a paralysis. They went into a semi uh, coma stage and stop breathing but the body was still alive and sometimes the breathing was so shallow that nobody at that time could perceive now we know that an individual can be without breathing for several minutes and being brought back to life which is the wrong term they're not being brought back to life they never actually died because death is irreversible but near death is where we live in this uh, indefinition of incarnated versus discarnated, right? So now we use uh, much more other techniques in terms of uh, brain activity. If the brain is not providing any information to the rest of the body, we know physiologically all of those organs will quickly start to degenerate and that's irreversible. So that's what we use, the brain dead, uh, as, as the criteria for death. And we know, and we've talked about this so often here, that the soul is an incarnated spirit. It is not the body. The soul and the spirit and the body and the perispirit compose our incarnated reality. Right? So the body is only an envelope. The soul or the spirit is the essential us or individuality. Can a body exist without a soul? Yes, but it is only when the body ceases to live that the soul quits it. 
Right, so we've had many lectures around birth, how the spirit is brought in into a body that's just been beginning to grow inside a mom's uh, womb. We know about the death, how we the spirit detaches itself from the body, sometimes quickly, sometimes more slowly. And we had very interesting debate last week about how long that lasts. Can we, um, you know, have cremation right away? Do we have to wait X number of hours? But the key point is the last one. Organic life may vitalize a body without a soul, but the soul cannot inhabit a body deprived of organic life. So there's essence of life. The body must be functioning for the spirit to live in it. If the body is dead, if the body sees working, the spirit has to leave. There are other related terms to euthanasia, right? There is the concept of dysthanasia. Um, and this is a situation where someone is basically clapped alive artificially. And our technology has evolved tremendously. We can keep bodies alive for many, many years, if that's the case. Which creates a, a, another moral challenge is, is back to the definition of dead. If it wasn't for these machines, the person would have died. So was that God's wish to begin with, that he should have been dead or she should have been dead by now? And we're keeping them alive, extending them beyond what God desired? And then there's ortho orthotanasia, it's also called passive euthanasia, which basically, I don't kill you, but I stop feeding you. Right? It's a, it's a little bit kind of not a very nice comparison. But in, uh, in the Middle Ages, if a woman was accused of being a witch, no, they devised a very interesting mechanism to killing her. They would drown her and says, if she comes out alive, then that's God wishes that she should live. If she dies, drown, is because she was a witch. So here is, we'll stop giving you food. If God wants to keep you alive, God will do that. If you die, it's because you were supposed to die anyway. Right? So to me, <clears throat> in most cases, passive euthanasia, it's not passive in a sense that you haven't done something. You have made a choice not to keep feeding that individual. That is not, that's an active decision that will lead to one's death. So it's, it's the word passive because the actual death, the moment of death was not caused by any immediate event, but is the almost automatic consequence of everything else that you have done to that point. So you see how complicated this all is? Euthanasia, right, is, is intentionally <coughs> ending a life, right? And, uh, and it's interesting because I've, I've spoken with, with healthcare professionals and let's say that you have a very severe case of cancer. You have tremendous pain. Your typical um, pain medication is not having any effect. So one of the things that they do is keep you sedated and constantly give you a medication to keep you sedated so you don't have to go through that suffering. Increasing that dose 10-20% might be enough to kill you. And nobody will know. We've seen a case of a nurse who's been accused of killing nine or possibly more people. That's how they do it. So unless the hospital has very strict control of how the medication is being uh, dispensed, it was very easy to terminate one's life, more so than we probably knew it was possible. But palliative care is a growing area, because as we grow older and we have the means, <clears throat> we want to have some some decency, some support in our end of life. So this is called palliative care. So these are individuals who can no longer be treated by current medical knowledge or techniques. They're given to an institution who will care for them 
who have somebody that can listen to them, help them, maybe give some medication, make them comfortable while they wait death. Sounds at first kind of creepy, <coughs> but it's probably one of the most charitable, most difficult jobs in the healthcare profession today. Because you know that every one of your patients will die very soon. So we have nothing but admiration for those who choose to be in that area. So we use in Canada <coughs> assisted death rather than euthanasia. Again, we, we're so good at spinning terms and, and creating uh, a perception that is not as severe. Because euthanasia sounds so violent, so wrong. Assisted death, there's this sense of charity, right? Of comfort, that we're helping somebody to die. Well, we're not helping them, we're making them die. That's very different. But we will continuously be affected by three different kind of points of views or, or influencers. The ethical and moral values, it's our individual consciousness. And, and as spiritists, we've been told that every spirit is created with the notion of the divine laws within them. Even if consciously, we may not realize that. Why was that? Why would God have put us those divine laws, the knowledge of the divine laws inside our spirit from its very creation. Because from that very moment we're subject to the law of cause and effect. So how could we be, quote, punished or suffer the consequences for something we did not know? So the spirit knows. However, so many other factors or an level of intelligence or culture or the evolution of our societies or notion of our morality and ethical values, they can hide this knowledge until we're kind of evolved to that point. So every spirit, even if they do not believe in God, atheists, even if they believe a different notion of God, as spiritists, we believe that every one of them cannot avoid the consequences of those acts. But again, let's not judge, because we might be put in that own same position. Are we prepared to take and suffer the pain, humiliation, lack of dignity, the impact that we're going to have on our loved ones, are we prepared to really not think about asking to be died, to be killed? I don't think any of us can truly 100% say that this will never pass through their mind if they're in that situation. But we're evolving. So the sense is that we need to understand if we're going to make the decision to continue to the very end. Why are we doing this? The other two kind of influencers or impactors are the legal and economic factors we talked about. Right? Pushing and creating some level of commonality across a, a wide set of people who are very different in their thoughts. And then coming in kind of uh, outside is the evolution, our scientific evolution, our technological evolution, who continues to push the envelope in our ability to cure. It is in that belief that all diseases we have today will be cured, that some people have been kind of convinced and freezing their body as if doing so would allow them to come back later on when the cure for the disease that they suffer has already been discovered. 
right? So if I have some type of cancer that today is not treatable, why not freeze my body and maybe in 50 years unfreeze me, apply the new drugs, and then I can continue my life as nothing has happened. Foolish thoughts. But technology is creating these, quote, possibilities. So this will continue to evolve over... I don't know, many centuries still to come. But today, we have to think about that. Because we will be put at some point in time, very likely, in a position to be part of that decision, either for our own parents, children, or ourselves. Relatives, friends. At the end, what is fundamental is to understand that it is the immortality of the soul that gives us the assurance that we're making the right decision. We have to think about immortality. Think of why we're here today, but more importantly, where we want to be tomorrow in our next lives. That this will matter. In the Gospel according to Spiritism, Kardec addresses this question, right? In chapter 5, Blessed or Afflicted, there is a question in Adam 27, should anyone put an end to another's probation where they can, or should God's purpose be respected? So leaving things to take their own course. That is the question. Should we do it first? And the answer is absolutely not. <coughs> We have already said repeatedly, and when the spirits say that, they're mad at us. I mean, they're very polite. <laughs> but any time in the spirits' book or in any of the Kadak's books, when the spirits come back and says, we have said repeatedly, and they don't use that often, but when they do, they're just saying, come on, guys. You can't be still thinking about this. Right? This is fundamental. This is basic. If you're asking that question, you're missing some very important understandings of the spirit's journey through its existence, right? That you're here for atonement. We do not atone by going to the movies, right? Or having fun, or having the good days in our lives. That's not atonement. Atonement is through our suffering. It's through our difficulties, that, the challenges that are given to us in life. And then the next one, how do you know whether the divine providence has placed you not as an instrument of torture to aggravate the suffering of the couple, but as the soothing balm of consolation to help heal the wound? So, so this is the question, should I kill somebody? And, and, and Kardec brings this like in the context of war. So if we're in war and then a colleague of mine is injured, almost you know, suffering, bleeding and so forth, should I just kill them and get them off the misery? And the Spirit says, who are you? What arrogance do you have to try to believe you even have the chance of understanding what is God's purpose for you? By doing what you're proposing to do, are you taking away a prized opportunity for an individual to atone for lives of errors that he's committed? How would you feel if you knew that that was true? A man is agonizing under cruel suffering. His state is known to be desperate. Would it be licit to save him a few instants? Just a few. Please, let me just give him a few instances of, of, of comfort. Right? So, again, who has given you the right to prejudge God's purpose? Right? The materialist is who only sees the body and does not take into consideration the spirit is not apt to understand these things. So these are very profound, very clear, leaves us no opportunity for this. But we still struggle with it. Why? Because we have been taught to love to protect, to take away suffering from the people we love. 
So we see a spouse, especially a child, suffering. And you know that there is no chance of it getting better. It will only get worse. Who of us would not consider saying God, even first pleading for God to take that person, to bring them to death quicker, to be merciful and kill them? But is that what that individual, that spirit actually needs? Is there not another plan for the individual to move on? So this is where now I've taken a bit of a different tangent from my original lecture last year. So I place you in the mind a set of what would you do if you saw somebody you love very much suffering? Would you not want to save them from that suffering? Would you not do anything to take away that pain from them? I think the answer is probably yes. We would have to fight that urge if we are going to follow the principles that we've been kind of hearing here today. So let me raise the ante here. Let's bring in someone who we would be so much more loving than any of our relatives, of our, even ourselves and our children. Let me, with his permission, bring Jesus into this. So imagine yourself back 2,000 years in Jerusalem. You are a follower of Jesus. You know he is God's son. He's come here to save us. He has been three years preaching through Galilee, giving us all of the laws and all of the rules we need to evolve ourselves. How much will be his, your love for Jesus at that time? We can't even begin to imagine. Now imagine you seeing Jesus being crucified or about to be crucified. At that point, nobody had a doubt Jesus is going to die. And he's not going to die a simple death. In fact, he was going to die the most painful way that man knew at that time. How to slowly kill and injure an individual. Jesus will knows even the day before where he's praying at the gardens. He knows what is going to happen to him. He knows that he will suffer more pain in, this, in that life than he had ever suffered in that life. And that he ultimately and surely would bring him to his death. Several hours. You know this as well. You see him struggling, walking with a heavy cross in his back, bleeding, being whipped, and knowing that he was going to be nailed to a wooden cross. Not knowing what would have happened after that moment, which of us would not have thought, let me get Jesus out of his suffering. Let, him, let us help him die now, quickly so he may return to the lap of his father. We would have thought that that is exactly what we were born to do. No one else would be loved by us as much. So if we had that thought and we had done this, what would have happened? Christianity would have been changed forever. Jesus would not have been crucified. We would not have the cross as the symbol of Christianity. More importantly, Jesus would not have pardoned the repentant thief. So by killing Jesus mercifully, as we were thought, through an euthanasia before he stepped up and, and is brought into the cross, and he's already feeling the blood and the pain coming out of him, but he is still providing pardon to a repentant thief and saying 
Truly, I say to you today, you shall be with me in paradise, giving him hope. You would have stolen that opportunity from Jesus and the thief. Who are you to do that? Final moments at the cross. Jesus has his mother and John with him. We're praying for him, watching him suffer. And at that moment, Jesus basically tells John that now you are the son of my mother and mother, you are the mom of John. And they will protect each other to ensure that Christianism will survive. We'll move on. He says, woman, here is your son. And to John, he says, here is your mother. Right? And from that moment on, John took Mary as his mother. And finally, finally, Jesus would not have told us that he forgave us. In his most touching moment, in his final, final minutes of life, he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. We would not have had that. So, every time you think that you know something, imagine that you have no clue. If we understand and accept that every minute of our life is here for a purpose, the good moments and the worst moments, we don't know what is our destiny or the destiny of the people we're trying to save. And by trying to save them, as we would have done to Jesus, we could, we could have created great damage. Missed opportunity. Now, I'm sure that if somebody had done this with Jesus, and maybe it happened before, Jesus would come back and do it all over again until he got it right. Because it was his mission to make this happen. But at this point in our choices, don't assume that you... Imagine that the minutes you're taking away from that individual could be precious to their evolution. Even if they're going to die, sometimes you have like we call the swan song, where the individual suddenly becomes conscious again and can express, can experience a few minutes of clarity. And that could be a fundamental few minutes for them. Or if that doesn't happen, even when sedated, the spirit is not sedated. They're going through their own process. That, whether we believe it or not, they asked for before incarnating in this life. So this is from Givaldo Pereira. He wrote a whole book on this, right? It's called uh, Eutanasia, Eutanasia Nunca, Euthanasia Never. And then it says, Life on Earth is an experience called reincarnation with the purpose of educating us to the great flight of immortality. It's like you might be taking the individual away from the final test that they have in this life. They don't complete the test. What happens when you don't complete a test in school? You have to repeat everything. So you might be condemning that individual to come back and suffer everything again. When there is no hope that anything will improve, the immortal spirit will always be rewarded for the trials of its earthly existence. Thank you very much. Stay. 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 <laughs> Very good. You made me cry. <laughs> questions? Comments? We do have two questions on the internet. So okay. Was, actually, the first one is what of uh, the requests for not to resuscitate? Can you please repeat? So question? it's the what we call DNR do not resuscitate. Do not, it's, it's, it's something you can put in in your medical record. It says do not resuscitate. In this case, um, my, get, my uh, understanding is this is not euthanasia. So we're asking medical team to 
stop bringing us to back to life. So if we are dying in this act that the body is giving up, do not do any special effort to bring me back. So I believe that in, in our current level of evolution is perfectly acceptable. Mm -hmm. Whether there are consequences later on, there might be some, but it's, I would not call that an euthanasia. There's another question from the internet. Repeat the question. Yes. Well, so the question is about cryogenics. What happens to the spirit if we freeze the body? <clears throat> I'm not sure. Maybe I got Marcus Macanians here. Is there any scientific proof that if you're free, frozen for years, you can come back to life afterwards? No, so, so the answer is actually quite simple. When the body is frozen, it's dead. Because... Yeah. So, so thank you. So that was my understanding as well. I mean, this this is probably just um, false advertisement that exists. His an this? hey, well, yeah. the answer is that as you freeze the body to the temperatures that happens in cryogenics, you kill the body, and at that point, the spirit will leave the body. Now we know that there are in real life scenarios where individuals can be brought to very low temperatures and after even certain long periods like 20 minutes 25 minutes be brought back to life but in cryogenics the temperatures are much lower and it's for longer periods so there is absolutely no scientific proof that any individual can be brought back to life without mechanism and being that body we know that the spirit leaves it and, and Marco made this comment that sometimes because the, the physical attachment of the spirit to the body they actually will suffer through the freezing process. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with, just to add, there's a similar idea with frozen embryos, right? So, because frozen embryos, uh, if they are vile, so they have a spirit attached to them, which is a very interesting point of debate, even for science and for us too. But, but in general lines, that embryos that are frozen, not viable, they don't have spirit attached to them. But potentially, some of them can have, because they can, they can actually come back to life. And so then there's a process of uh, that being part of the reincarnatory plan for that specific spirit, too. And that's something that I don't, I don't think we have all the answers yet. It's just like something very interesting. So Marcus' comment was uh, around frozen embryos. Isn't that the same thing as freezing a uh, human being? Right? If we imagine that uh, the term he uses is viable, it means that the spirit has already attached to that embryo. Uh, so the, the, the current thought is that those embryos that can actually come to term afterwards, they were viable before being frozen. And those who were not yet viable before frozen will continue to be non-viable after the freezing. But we still have much more to learn about the whole science and the ability of what that means to the spirit and uh, our current understanding that that's part of the reincarnatory kind of process and suffering that the spirit has decided uh, even before coming to earth. I have a question from Kim. So what's the question? Is that wrong? Well, if, if you're in a machine, and often when people turn off machines, we've seen cases where the individual does not die. Yeah. They can actually recover and become healthy or, or living for a long time. Others will, will live for a short time and, the, and then die. Others will die immediately. So all of these three scenarios are a reflection of what was his life to be. Mm -hmm. 
Well, it's, it's a very generic term because there's a different levels of what the machine is doing. The level of, uh, you know, we have induced comas that we do with individuals. So science keeps pushing the envelope more and more around that. But there are individuals that are basically almost brain dead with very little activity and the machines are still keeping the, the body alive. And when they turn off the machine, the body dies immediately. And so understanding that spirit has probably left that body a long time ago. Mm-hmm. But still, we should leave the machine, according to our beliefs. Should we leave the machine? Well, we have to trust uh, where where science is at this point. If there is no real sense that the individual is still there, then there's no point keeping the machine going. So when the body is on the machine, the steers already. Depends. Depends on the, s- the the disease, the level. So the question is, I- if the, the if the individual is on a machine, does it mean that the spirit has left? No, it doesn't necessarily mean because there's, there's so many different levels of, of medically different conditions mm-hmm. that reflect that. In some extreme conditions, very likely the spirit has left. There's one more question. There's uh, one movie from Stephen Hawking. He was brought to life after how many days? I don't know. He was in the machine. He was, he was okay. kept alive for a long time. You have to. So he's talking about a Stephen Hawking, Stephen. Yeah. Okay. And that has been fundamental to to such an evolution of of physics. Last question from Mr. Magalhães. Do you want to come up to the front? Because otherwise it has to repeat because we can't hear here. You came late, but I want to make sure that you got involved. (laughs) So I just want to add something to make it easier for us to understand the separation of the body and spirit. It's actually, uh, the the process is actually very complicated because the vital principle is surrounding every single cellular system in your body. So even if parts of your body are dying, the spirit still may be partially connected because the vital principle is still flowing through the body, at least partially in certain organs. So even in multiple organ failure, you know, it's not immediately that this, this organ dies and then the spirit goes away. It may take days, it may take weeks, you know, so it's, it's a very uh, slow process in most cases. And if the video is plugged into a machine and the body is actually functional, the spirit's still there, it can't go away. It's physically connected to the energy that the, all your cells are producing as this vital principle is going around you. But when that is extinct, like when that goes away, then yes, sure, the disconnection will occur. But it may still take a few weeks after that for it to completely disconnect. So it's, it's a very interesting balance, right, uh, between the spirit and the body in the dying process, right? Uh, so, I mean, and I just to make sure that you guys understand what Joe said is that you know when when you turn off the machines which is a very generic term but in other words when you when you say okay it's enough let's uh, let's take life support out you know let's let this individual uh, discriminate right um, we have that every case is a different case we can't use one rule to say oh this is what we have to do that's it that's not realistic that's not nice um, but at the same time spiritism and science work together hand in hand so we're not here uh, as you know you know trying to judge from a religious perspective or a scientific perspective but we need to understand both sides at the same time and if from the scientific side we get to a conclusion there's no brain activity in this individual there's no blood flow in the brain there's no, and then the heart, you know, you know, there's certain criteria you have to go through. So you do, you see, you know, EEG, you have to do certain tests, you look at the coma scale, and you do all sorts of things, and then you realize, listen, this individual is not going to come back to life, period, right? And then that's when you have to make the decision whether keeping that, the par- parts of his body running or not, which is different from an individual who is in a long-term chronic disease that requires... Um, the body to be connected to certain machines to be alive, but still conscious is still going to live for many years, saying, listen, let's turn off the machines. You know, you can see the differences in the decisions, hugely different. So we cannot make a one-size-fits-all 
explanation for this, basically. It's like it's every single individual has a plan, and every single plan is different, basically. So, so the conclusion is we know very little. Yeah. Yeah. One day, science will be able to determine whether the spirit is still in the body or not, but we're very, very far away from that. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Thank you so much. And we are now going to call the kids, and we are going to have our our Sunday passes. Thank you very much for all of you who's been watching us, and tune in for our Wednesday, Thursdays, and next Sunday lectures. Thank you. <laughs>